Hey everybody, um, thanks again for the invitation. We will jump right in. Um, so one of the things I think that you'll see, and, and I know Dr. Ryder is very modest, to give you an idea of how we're kind of connected to the system. Um, I also provide medical direction for the city. Uh, Dr. Weiser wears a couple of hats with the state. I also do the critical care transport piece over here, which is kind of difficult. But one of the things that I hope you're seeing is that EMS really is kind of a misnomer. It's not really emergency medical services. What it is is really a system of care. So one of the beauties and frustrations of what it is that we deal with every day is in addition to the social challenges of health uh, in terms of what to do with patients who don't have access, we also have to deal with the problem of how to get patients into an academic medical center. And for those of you that are our residents, you know that even when you're in our ED, this can be exceedingly difficult. Um, and EMS, therefore, is both a passion and a beautiful frustration. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that because COVID has literally turned everything upside down. What we used to do, and I know this is a common theme, and it's really great to hear everybody else talk about this. What we used to do, you know, you call, you hope for the best, you match a resource with the appropriate need, has been exceedingly difficult, especially in the time of uh, COVID, uh, because it requires a little bit of restriction. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the critical care transport piece, which is another one of my uh, passions, and it's posed significant challenges, especially as you talk about intubation and, and uh, triaging people to other modes of ventilation. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, I think critical care transport in the COVID area has a couple things. So first of all, we have to talk about what type of services are we doing now. It used to be um, in the initial um, in the initial sort of rollout of this, we talked about that everybody needed to be intubated because that was the safest thing. We put everybody on HEPA filters. You're in a box that's relatively combined. If you're flying in a helicopter, this is a 407. We have a EC-135 helicopter, which is a small little sports car. We don't recirculate the air. And despite the fact that people think you can open the window and you know hang your head outside, it is impossible to recirculate air, especially in an, air, in an environment where you're aerosolizing. So uh, what was pretty much routine, where we used to take pretty much everything, we have now a couple of, um, a couple of restrictions. And it's interesting, you're hearing these um, debates about, well, what do we transport? And it's very difficult to talk about age. Well, what's really um, interesting about COVID is that we have now been talking about this for quite some time, meaning that patients that are critically ill, that are on multiple pressors, that are on non-invasive ventilation, we now talk about DNR because, as you might imagine, it is very difficult to orchestrate cardiac arrest management if you are either prone, if you're lying on the side, or if you're receiving multiple pressors on APRB and transport. So we've had to talk about risk benefits now for quite some time ever since the first COVID transport had actually happened because we were also interested in making sure that we match the patient population, the right patient at the right time with the right resource. So um, I totally appreciate what's been going on. I know you heard previous discussions about, well, is it appropriate to bring somebody who may be advanced in age with significant comorbidities who's intubated just because we need an ICU bed, and now that we're exposing additional amount of crew members of people, sometimes that decision is, let's talk about goals of care, maybe that's hospice, let's talk about alternative destinations, or maybe we can't help that patient because it's not in the risk-benefit synthesis, uh, it doesn't represent um, maybe the most safe option. So, uh, in terms of critical care, in terms of what we do, uh, we do non-invasive ventilation, which is high flow. Uh, I know Dr. David Gordon will be very pleased to hear that we do APRV, which is another advanced mode of ventilation for our patients that are intubated with COVID. Uh, we also provide ECMO cannulation, uh, ECMO, well, support for ECMO cannulation, patients that are being transported to a referral center where you have a very young patient. The criteria has been, uh, I think, very strict and limiting, but if you have a very young patient with terrible lungs, we will also transport those patients from hospital A to hospital B, and that requires uh, a fairly heavy lift um, involving respiratory therapists. We all know that they are not just little adults, <laughs> except for the fact that we are and that we put them in the same ambulance and use them, we use a similar team, which is great. Uh, because I'd also put a plug here for, for transport medicine. Those of you that say, you know, if, if you feel that your um, scope of emergency medicine practice is being somehow limited, what is great when you do with the critical care side is that literally I think my first day that I took over from Dr. Gash, hello if you're out there, Dr. Gash, uh, we literally had a massive transfusion protocol from one hospital uh, with multiple gunshot wounds because that's what happens in the era of COVID. Uh, we took the patient from hospital A to hospital B, uh, chest tubes and thoracic decompression. We also do with pediatrics. We also transport well neonates. So um, interestingly enough, the first COVID transport occurred uh, from an airport. So uh, nobody had known uh, what, this, uh, what this was going to entail, but I remember very clearly the first COVID transport for our system uh, happened at a, a remote location, and so we were still kind of figuring this out. We used two ambulances instead of 
one, because those of you engaged in EMS uh, know that ambulances sometimes break down or in the city, maybe they may catch on fire, one never knows. <laughs> so our plan was to take one ambulance with, with the equipment, another one with the crew, because sometimes it's also challenging when you deal with issues of contamination. So we went to the airport uh, to pick up this first patient. This was a patient that was being repatriated from overseas, was in need of advanced uh, ventilatory support, had, I think at one point in time, the vasopressor requirement, and we consulted with infection prevention and made the determination that the risks outweighs the benefits because we wanted to match this patient with an appropriate level of care. So we no longer use two trucks because we rapidly found out that ICU beds, this COVID is a disease of intensive care availability, especially for the critical care patients. So I think we found out pretty much on hour two that this concept of taking two trucks to take care of one COVID patient was not at all sustainable. Uh, and that also posed further challenges to what it is that we do too. So several specific concerns. We, um, just, just for the purposes of our transport program, uh, we can prone, but we do not. We do not prone and transport simply because in order to do this in the middle of a pandemic uh, protocol requires a lot of coordination. Plus, there's logistics in terms of how do you provide CPR. Uh, currently, we, we do not provide CPR and around. We try not to for COVID-positive patients that are intubated. Um, so a couple of things in terms of dangers of aerosolization. Uh, we're also seeing some really interesting physiology. So sometimes uh, with patients that are intubated with COVID pneumonia, and I know Dr. Sanavita talked about this earlier, the amount of driving pressures that you need on the ventilators are excessive. So we encountered actually two patients who we were not able to ventilate simply because the flow rate and pressures were so high. We actually had to bring a hospital ventilator uh, and deal with personnel who were trained on a servo rather than the, cur the current transport vent that we utilize. So I'm simply making the point that this is one of the reasons why emergency medicine and critical care professionals and pediatricians need to be involved because putting somebody in an ambulance and matching them, matching their needs with the transport capability is, I think, a very complicated decision. So here we were outside of unnamed airport for the purposes of uh, HIPAA and everything else that applies to care within the United States. Uh, I've eliminated all sort of, uh, so if, if you recognize what this airport is, please don't tell me uh, and, and don't report me. But um, what was interesting is this was, we were supposed to basically take the person from point A to point B, so Customs gets to the airport and Customs uh, actually goes ahead and says, oh, this person was coming from out of state. They look at the aircraft, which was uh, the tail number of Stuart for the purpose of identification. So poor Customs gets out and sees people in spacesuits and they were like, holy crap, uh, where is the CDC? And I said, the CDC is not coming to this particular airport. Literally two minutes later, somebody <laughs> slaps on the CDC with this cool little light. I was like, oh, look, somebody else wants to participate in the EMS. So this first particular transport, we coordinated with Customs and Border Protection uh, CDC, uh, and a couple of other people. Now, transport logistics are interesting. Now, for those of you that know me, for example, I take pride on eliminating backwards uh, from the armamentarium and the BMS, but it occurred to me, um, how do you transport patients from a Learjet uh, outside and put them in a waiting ambulance? So this is something we use for luggage, uh, and we rapidly figured out that, well, if we put the patient on a backboard for the purpose only of extrication, backwards are extrication devices, <laughs> we can move them back. And I would be lying if I didn't tell you that one of these members uh, had a very difficult time and may or may not have fallen off of this luggage conveyor belt while trying to maintain the bag valve mask and the tube clamps while we're transitioning this patient to the ambulance. So literally COVID is something that is a, it, it, it is uncharted territory because uh, this patient required, did not go through the normal sort of a uh, transport apparatus. So uh, again, I, I mentioned this just to say that there are a lot of sort of, um, nuances, especially with respect to transport. So in terms of making this successful, we really need to collaborate with a lot of our other talking with area hospitals, maintaining availability. One of the great things about COVID is that it has been a catalyst. So uh, where your intensive care uh, agencies did not previously collaborate, now we have conference calls, uh, as those of you may know, who participate on them every day, every hour, every half hour about what is the ICU availability, uh, how do we transport patients in between uh, different ICUs, and I think we have a much better situational awareness, at least with respect in our system, about how to utilize those resources, because um, ICU beds are, are, are certainly at a premium. And I very selfishly am very glad because um, before emergency preparedness, quite frankly, was a word that we didn't use. Um, we used to drill maybe twice a year, that was the requirement, but the amount of times people were in seats actually talking about critical care transport of any volume, like if you needed to move, let's say, 20 people at any given time and it would oversaturate the current demands, how do we have a drill and how do we get people together? 
Well, COVID has certainly brought people to the table because now we have drills all the time. We recently conducted a tabletop exercise with all area hospitals um, about what would happen if we had a critical care surge. So, um, you know, there's a saying in emergency preparedness is don't let any disaster go and utilize. Uh, and I really hope that we don't lose those lessons because what I have seen, at least in my experience, uh, COVID has broken down the barriers, broken down the barriers, and I think we're now communicating with a lot of other agencies in hospitals that we, we wouldn't have done as routinely previously. So, good stuff. Um, I think Dr. Weiser mentioned some things in terms of policies, and, and one of the things I would recommend is that if you are in a position of leadership within your hospital, try to at least in the back of your head think about how your policy would impact the system. In our hospital, for example, forget about just um, one hospital's offload policies. We, I think, have, what is it, about a dozen different policies for the various different units here. So it is extremely important to think about how to think about patients holistically because offload is a, a problem that we all need to wrap our heads around. Uh, there's also um, ramifications in terms of when patients get sick and, and actually when staff get sick and how do you deal with that. So that's just um, a, a broad overview of some critical care transport considerations. I think Dr. Greither had um, very well illustrated the issue of how EMS is basically a broader sort of conception of resources. We talk about how to match patients from the, the 911 center to various resources, which may not even be uh, a transport unit, may not even be a hospital. Uh, so that is something I, we, we have definitely learned a lot of lessons through continued ongoing discussion. So uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity uh, and we would certainly be happy to answer any questions about either critical care transport logistics programs that are going on between our jurisdictions. So thank you so much for your time. And Dr. Matu, um, I graduated in 2008. I'm sorry I'm a little bit older. <laughs> I feel bad because I was one of the first people to complete his fellowship in 2009 and 10. So maybe that's the issue. My apologies. I already sent it out over the chat that I got the dates wrong. Okay. I think... Uh, uh, poor Sarah Scott. I know she's listening and Mimi <laughs> Lewis. We still stick together. Absolutely. Stronger together, hashtag. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, ben, and, uh, so, all right, ben and Jenny, thank you very much. Jenny, if you have Ben's lithium, you can give it to him now. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions, if, if there's any questions out there. So. There was one. What's happening in other counties in Maryland with EMS? So, there's a bunch of... Um, if they want to know about one specific county, it would probably be a little bit helpful to know that answer. But Baltimore County, for example, is um, really just focusing on PPE for the providers. The rate of PUI transport, since I work with the county too, seems to be similar to what we're seeing in the city. Um, their offload times are a little bit quicker than they are in the city, even at some of our neighboring hospitals. Um, the majority of the time, the nice thing is, uh, like, uh, we have Friday meetings now with kind of the central quarter, like the 95 quarter of Maryland. So PG, Montgomery, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Montgomery, thrown in there, Anne Arundel, um, and all the medical directors sit in, on our computers <laughs> and chat about what they're seeing in their jurisdictions to reflect it. So a lot of our thoughts are the same um, behind that. So we've brought up how to decrease aerosolization during bagging and one interesting thing that came up out of a case that was out of Anne Arundel County is we found out that in the 911 dispatch cards, they were still recommending mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation under certain circumstances when they hit one particular card. And that's probably not a good idea anymore anyway, but especially in the setting of doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth on COVID patients. And it turns out that the medical system to change that. It has to actually come as a directive from the state, and it became actually a much bigger issue that we were able to solve. Um, but it was probably happening in the other jurisdiction too. It just never became a QA case. You know, I, I just wanted to briefly respond to some of the issues at the convention center. Um, so there's a lot of things that are going on on the county level in terms of utilization of pandemic protocols. I have to give a shout out to our state agency, who I think has been rather nimble. Um, previously in Maryland, it would have taken years to enact a protocol that deals with telephone triage. And right now, I think because of the pandemic operations, we have the ability to look outside of the proverbial box and do it best with patients. Now, with respect to the convention center, the convention center was incepted because we thought there was going to be a huge surge of patients that were uh, rather sick but not requiring ICU. Now, we can debate about how this evolves, but currently the National Guard, 
uh, has contracted with other sort of hospitals to create a center for convalescing patients. So to be very clear, the convention center is for patients that are being discharged with a very low to minimal oxygen requirement. So the beds are still there. The interesting thing is that if you look at our hospital capacity, at least with the medical system, our med surge beds are open. So I, I don't want to use that as, a, as an encouragement to incentivize everyone, <laughs> but means that the medicine services are literally saying, well, what am I going to do? And they're sitting there having to uh, escalate admissions to IMC or ICU, meaning that uh, there's a lot of capacity. So we have seen, I think it's fair to say, a underutilization of that convention center. Um, it, was never, it was never stood up to sort of receive ambulances. It was never stored up to, to receive patients that were undifferentiated from an EMS. The great thing about COVID is that uh, we are now in discussions about whether we demobilize that center or we actually shift its purpose, uh, and that's through an ongoing discussion with state stakeholders and also stakeholders at the medical center level. So the beds are still there. Uh, it's the fact that the hospitals currently, uh, from a system perspective, have capacity for med surge beds. All right. Well, great. Well, once again, my thanks to uh, Ben and Jenny, and uh, stick around. I'm sure there might be some other questions that come up.